How many of you like basics? The basic stuff. The simple stuff. All right. Because that's what you're getting this morning. Uh, Vince Lombardi was asked how come he had such winning teams all the time. And he said because he basically never left the basics. And, and as deep as we can go in the Bible and, and, and in uh, discussions and theology, there's times we have to go back to the basics for those foundational things once again, right? So instead of a sermon, we're going to go over times tables this morning. Wouldn't that be awful? Yes. No, we're going to go through the basics. So I want to say good morning, New Horizons Community Church. And for those watching our church online, we want to welcome you to this morning's experience. And this morning, I'd like to ask that you would turn in your Bible or flip on your tablet or your muted phone, okay, and look with me to the book of John. I was sharing this morning with a friend of mine that uh, we just started this series a couple weeks ago, and the thing is, is when someone professes a newfound faith in Jesus Christ, I personally, I like to direct them to the, the book of John because it has such wonderful basic stuff in it for foundational use. And today we're going to continue our study as we go to John chapter 2, and we're going to look at the first 11 verses. And we'll read that together. And if you didn't bring your Bible, that's really okay, because we'll provide you with the scripture uh, on this morning's uh, video screens here. Now, before we go there, who, how many of you love weddings? How many of you love weddings? Come on. Really? Just, you know, it's the younger people, older people. Where's the love? How many of you love weddings? Well, unless you're a parent, it's free food. Now, weddings in Jesus' day, they were a lot different than today. Because, see, many times today, marriage is looked at as, as optional or even temporary. Or in some cases, they'll say a big joke. What happens is sometimes people will meet over a weekend in the Smokies or in Vegas, and they'll get married at the Elvis Presley Wedding Chapel that same weekend kind of like a dare. I don't know what it is. At the same time, more and more people are living together instead of getting married. And that certainly wasn't the way it was in Jesus' day. See, the first thing different is that many of the marriages, they were arranged. I know you're going to think this is strange, but somehow the older I get, sometimes I think that it wasn't necessarily, necessarily, that's a big word that you can use for a lot of different things, but it wasn't necessarily a bad idea. Because the fact was is that marriages were arranged. It didn't mean that the couple didn't love each other. It meant that they grew to love each other. Just like couples learn to love each other today. The warm, fuzzy feelings, the sweaty palms, that isn't love. That's hormones. But sometimes love can grow out of that. The problem comes when the hormones take over the relationship and they call that love. I remember one time listening to Dr. James Dobson, and he basically said, there are, when it comes to a marriage relationship or to a relationship between people that have feelings towards one another, he said, there's two types of love. He said, there's the hormone warm, fuzzy feeling where you just can't get enough of that person. And he said, that's not bad. And in fact, throughout your married life, you ought to pursue that with one another. You should try to, to continue to court your spouse, to please them, to want to be... So, but that is not what you rely on. And I can tell you people that have been married for years, that isn't what you rely on. What you rely on in love, love is also a choice. It is a commitment to live together in the covenant of marriage no matter what. Right? Okay, that's what... That, so I look at my wife, and she looks at me, and I know that there are times she would love to kill me. I know that. But love stops murder. <laughs> that should be a bumper sticker. But arranged marriages, they kind of help to prevent that murder, that divorce, that living together. And, and it wasn't like the couple was thrown together as complete strangers. See, if they agreed with the arrangement, when they reached a certain age, they were then betrothed to one another. And a betrothal was the opposite of shacking up today. Couples today live together so they can be sexually intimate, 
with each other without having the responsibilities or the commitments that maybe would go along with marriage. Betrothal meant that the couple had all the responsibilities and the, the commitments associated with marriage, but without the sexual intimacy. It sounds like a whole lot better test of love, I think, than today's way, doesn't it? Let's, hey, let's, let's share these responsibilities. Let's see how well we can get along without killing one another. And the betrothal was serious. It lasted for an entire year, and the only way out of it was a divorce. But the fact is, most betrothals were successful, just like most marriages back then were. I certainly can't say that today. So for the happy couple in this morning's passage, the time of betrothal was over, and it was time to get on with the wedding. Now by now, I hope you have found John chapter 2. We're going to look at the first 11 verses. So let's read that together. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water pots. Now, I'm going to continue on with the message and with the sermon and with the scripture, but maybe many of you have read this before without getting the next handful of words. The kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, so they filled them to the brim. And then he added, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet, banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from. The servants, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, he then called the bridegroom over aside and he said, bring everyone out to this. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, he says, everyone brings out the, the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best until now. What Jesus did here in Canaan of Galilee was the, the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Most weddings today are over in a few hours, even if you include the reception. Weddings back then lasted up to seven days. Relatives and close friends and the bride and the groom would have everything planned out. Either the parents of the bride or the groom or very close friends would act as the, the host, if you would. And the reason that Mary was so concerned about this deal with the wine in the passage is that she was probably acting as one of the hosts. Why else would she be concerned? As such, she was one of the, repeat, one of the people responsible for all the details of the party, including the food and drinks. So sometime after the plans were made and everything was in place, it was time for the groom to make his move, fully dressed in his finest robes and his jewels. In the dark of night, he would emerge from his home to go claim his bride. When he arrived at her house, the friend of the bridegroom would announce, I guess that would be almost like the best man, would announce his presence and call the bride out. Then she would emerge from her house, veiled and adorned like a queen. Although she didn't know the exact time of her groom's arrival, she was ready when he called. And when he called, they emerged, and at that point, they were surrounded by friends and relatives. Vows were exchanged and a formal document was signed, and they were officially married. But the party was just getting started. After a ritual washing of the hands, remember the jars? After a ritual washing of the hands, 
The wedding feast began. A procession of family and friends would light the way with oil lamps and fill the air with music and singing and dancing. They escorted the bride and the groom back to a canopy outside of his parents' house. And there they presided over the feast, which would last up to seven days. That's when our passage happened, when the party was in full swing. That meant that it would have been a terrible time to run out of food and drinks. Today, if you run out of punch at a wedding reception, it's really not a big deal. You just, you run to Hannaford's, Hannaford's, and you buy some extra Sprite and you pour it in the punch bowl and nobody really cares. But back then, it was a big deal. The best case scenario would be that the host would be scandalized forever by the people of the community. They might not even remember who the wedding was for, but they would remember that Mary let the wine run out. And that was the best case scenario. The worst case scenario would be that the wedding guests could actually sue the happy couple. There was a law that if the feast failed in any way, the guests could sue the bride and the groom for up to half the value of their wedding presents. This is no trivial thing, folks. You better not run out of Sprite back then. It was a big deal. Now, before we go on, I need to address something. I know you'll keep those cards and letters coming, and that's okay. Because when some people see this passage, all they can see is wine. And if that's the case, that is a shame. It's a shame that they get hung up on something so trivial, and they miss the point of the whole message. Yes, Jesus did turn water into wine. I've heard people try to say or twist the original language to say that Jesus turned it into grape juice. It's not true. It was called wine. There's no linguistic or textual basis for making such a claim. We have to face the fact that Jesus turned water into wine, and it was an alcoholic beverage, but don't let me finish. As is the case with many places around the world today, the water was not drinkable back in Jesus' day. So in order to kill the bacteria and the parasites in the water, something had to be added to it. And in many places around the world today and in Jesus' day, it was something that was alcohol. And the alcohol was wine. It wasn't beer. It wasn't liquor. It wasn't a low-grade alcohol. Con- I mean, it, it was. It, it, was a, it was a low-grade alcohol content, much, much lower than the content of alcohol today. And even then, it was mixed with one part to three parts water. So the wine in our passage that that was brought, it hadn't been diluted yet. But clearly, it wasn't for the purpose of intoxication. Why? Because drunkenness was strictly forbidden by the Jewish law, and it was not tolerated in their society. And not just sloppy drunkenness either, even slight impairment was strictly forbidden. So while it's not okay to to deny that this was real wine, by the same token, it's not okay to use it as the excuse, well, then if Jesus turned water into wine, it's okay to drink. I'm not saying that. Because even one drink of today's alcohol beverage produces a level, level of impairment that was forbidden in the law of God. If you don't believe me, if you don't believe me, that even one drink can produce impairment, just look at the the drinking and driving laws. In every state, including Maine, 0.08 blood alcohol level will get you arrested for DUI. That is one glass of today's wine or beer. And a person could have consumed several glasses of the diluted wine in Jesus' day without it even registering on a breathalyzer. But once again, I say all that to say this. It's not the point of the message. John tells us the point of the passage in verse 11. Look at it. The point of the passage is that this miracle manifested the glory of Jesus Christ. And because of the manifest manifest glory of Jesus Christ, people believed. So that brings us to two questions. How did this miracle make manifest the glory of Christ, and why did his disciples believe on him? So first, let's look at the miracle and how it made manifest the glory of Christ. 
it made manifest, meaning bringing it to order, it, 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 it allowed you to see the glory of Christ because of four things that happened as the change was made from water to wine. The first thing was the change from water to wine, it was unseen. So imagine if you were one of the servants standing there. This is my servant stand. You're one of the servants standing there. They don't stand great, no. And I'm sure Mary was almost in a panic. And if you were a servant there, you would have fully expected to be running over all over the little tiny town of Cana buying every bit of wine at hand. Because you remember what happens when you run out. Bad deal. And if they had run all over town, it still wouldn't have been enough. But Mary didn't send them out. She told them to do whatever Jesus asked them to do. And, and it, I, love, I love this story, and I'll tell you why. Because he sent them on such a wild goose chase. He sent them to fill up the jugs that everybody used to wash their hands in. Crazy. That, how crazy is that? But they were good servants. And so they did what they told. No matter how crazy as it sounded, and just to make a point, they filled them up to the brim. That way you can see Jesus. And Jesus told them to do something even crazier. He told them to dip out a ladle full of the hand-washing water and take it over to the head guy. I don't know about you, but this servant would have questions in his mind at that point. Like, he's going to get them beaten for sure. But Mary was in charge, and she said do whatever Jesus said. So they were simply obedient. Imagine that. They had carried the ladle over to the head man, fully expecting him to spit it out, or even spit it in their faces. But he didn't. He tasted it with delight. Mm. That's my delightful sound. Don't share yours with me later, okay? The look on his face told how good it tasted. And then he bragged on it, not just to the servants. It was so good, he called the bridegroom away, you know, and he commented him to him. This was the best wine he'd ever tasted. But when did it happen? Help me understand. When did the miracle occur? Did it happen in the jugs? Did it happen when it was being scooped up by the ladle? Maybe. Did it happen when it was being poured from the ladle into the head man's cup? We don't know. All we know is that it did happen. The change was unseen. And it happened at an elemental level where no one could watch what was taking place. There weren't any bubbles in the water pots. It, there was no Hollywood smoke. There was no shaking. There was no evidence that a fundamental change was taking place. But it did. There was no mistaking the fact that what was, was no more. And what it became was something totally, completely, fundamentally different. The change was unseen. It was also unspectacular. Now this certainly was, wasn't something Hollywood would have put on. It wasn't surrounded by hype and pomp and circumstance. This was Jesus' first miracle. And if there ever would be thought of, you could have something spectacular happened without fireworks or shooting stars or angels or something. He didn't even make an announcement. Did you know that? It was as if there, it was such a thing, it was, I don't know, if there was ever such a thing as a discreet miracle, this was it. And I would think, you know, Jesus would come over and hum and hum and hum and No, no, no. He didn't even touch it himself. So he had the servants fill the pots with water. And then he had them draw out the wine. He didn't even tell them the change had taken place. But man, what a change had taken place. The change was unspectacular. It was also unprecedented. Nothing like this had ever happened before or since. As the wine ran out, it was like, it wasn't like Mary had any experience to draw from. 
I don't believe that she was looking for Jesus to perform a miracle. He certainly never had any, the, you know, for, for 30 years, when emergencies happened, Mary, the mom, had to deal with them, just like anybody else. And I'm sure when this emergency happened, that's what she was expecting to do. See, most scholars believe that Joseph had already died. Joseph was Jesus' earthly father, but he'd already died by this time. So Jesus was now the man of the house. And she would have naturally looked to him to do something to fix the problem. Who knows what she was expecting. Maybe she wanted him to round up his disciples and head into town to get some more. I don't know. I'm sure that Mary had sent Jesus on errands before, but now was the time for something unprecedented to happen. Now was the time for Jesus to make an unprecedented change to actually create a new, wonderful thing out of something ordinary and old. The change was unprecedented. The change was unseen. It was unspectacular. It was also unmistakable. The people surely would have noticed if they were drinking dirty, hand-washing water. They didn't drink water all that much, even much less at a wedding feast. Remember, I told you the water would be bad for you. So it was obvious to everyone that they were drinking wine. And just like the governor or the head guy at the feast, they knew it was a very good wine. The result of the change was obvious to everyone. There was no hiding the fact that this was wine. The taste, the aroma, the color, the fact that this liquid was wine was unmistakable. A change, it had taken place. A miracle had happened that clearly manifest the glory of Jesus. Now, Jesus took plain, flavorless, dirty water and changed it into wine. The change was unseen. It was unspectacular. It was unprecedented. It was unmistakable. It was a miracle that manifest the glory of Christ. But the question goes back to verse 11. Why did that cause the disciples to believe on him? It caused them to believe on Jesus because that wasn't the only miracle that took place that day. Jesus was changing water into wine. That was the first miracle. But Jesus changing the hearts of the disciples, that was his greatest miracle. The disciples had been following Jesus for a little while. They were curious and were learning from him. But the true miracle of salvation hadn't taken place yet. But as that water became wine, wow, what happened? Their hearts of stone were made flesh. They were brought to a new life in Christ. Old things had passed away and all things became new. Their lives were changed. Their lives and the change in their lives, it was unseen. It was a miracle, but it happened inside. See, you can't see when Jesus saves us. You can't see it. Every individual reacts differently on the outside. Some people cry, they weep. Some people shout. Some people don't do either. But the true change happens where? On the inside. That's where it should happen. It is as unseen as when that water turned to wine. The change in their lives was unseen, and it was unspectacular. There aren't any fireworks that goes on when a person is saved, other than maybe inside. There are no halos, no lights, no wings, no angels, no chorus. None of those things. Just like there were none of those things when the water was turned to wine. Bells and whistles and 
spectacular events, they usually don't accompany salvation. Because salvation is an inward thing. It's an inward change that is unseen and unspectacular. The change in the disciples' lives were, was also unprecedented. They had never had that before. They had no experience to build on. They didn't have anything to rehearse or practice. This salvation thing with Jesus, God brings it brand new. It is brand, and it was brand new because salvation is brand new. The, the change in their lives was unprecedented. It was unprecedented, and it was unmistakable. When Jesus saved those disciples that day, they were unmistakably different. Now, some of you may be sitting back and going, what do you mean they weren't saved? I didn't hear anyone say the sinner's prayer. Do you know that's a recent thing, the sinner's prayer? Confession's always been around. Don't misunderstand me. But if I see, and I've been walking with Jesus, I, you know, I've, I've seen all the things. I've, I've seen him get dirty as we walk down the road. I've seen him take a bath in the lake. I've seen, he's a guy. He's just a guy. And then one day we're at this wedding. whoop doo Fresh food. It's awesome. We're running out of wine. Mary says something. And he tells you he's the one by doing that. And where does salvation come? By recognizing Jesus for who he is and placing your faith in him. And that's what happened. It was amazing. And all of a sudden, I realized he's the Messiah. And you know what happened for those guys? They didn't act the same. They, they didn't talk the same. They didn't live the same. Did they make mistakes? Yeah. Did they fall back into sin sometimes? Yeah. But they were completely a new creation. They didn't live in perpetual disobedience. They didn't live in continual rebellion. In other words, my friends, they didn't go back to tasting like old, dirty, hand-washing water. They were now in Christ. And Christ was in them. And they had a new name written down in heaven. And a new life to live here on earth. Man, that's awesome. The change was unmistakable. As I asked the Praise team, come back up here. I've got to ask you a question. We've talked about nothing but change today. Water into wine, follower into disciple. Have you ever had that change? I'm serious. Have you ever had that change? Because I think the thing that I pray about most as I'm getting ready for church is that you don't leave the same. I'm not asking if you've ever walked an aisle. That's a new thing too. I'm not asking if you've ever been baptized. I'm asking, have you personally ever been changed? Have you ever seen the glory of Christ manifest, in other words, made real so you can see it, by his spirit through the word. Have you ever seen the glory of Christ and believed in him? Hmm? See, one day, one day before too long, Jesus will return as a bridegroom is returning for his bride. And the question is, is will you be ready when he calls for you? you know that's what my job is? Is to tell you the groom's on his way. And the only way you will be ready, and this is the truth, the only way you'll be ready is not by trying harder. 
The only way you'll be ready is not by attending church more. The only way you'll be ready is not by reading the word more. I know that's going to ruffle some feathers. I'm going to get to what works. Even giving to the church, which now makes the board members upset. No, I'm kidding. If you're ready to receive him as he miraculously changed you from the sinner you were born to the saint he called you to be, will you allow him to make that change in you today? That's about as simple a gospel message, people, as you'll ever hear. For 19 years of my life, I was the dishwater. I was the hand-washing water. And he turned me into wine. I'm not saying I don't make mistakes. I've made millions. But Jesus is in here, and he's always working on me. Because I trust him to work on me. Father, Thank you that your spirit spoke to us this morning. And I pray, Lord, that we would realize that if a change hasn't taken place, that you can make all things new, that we would receive you this morning. That we would be like those servants to just do whatever you ask. And in doing so, Lord, may your glory be made manifest in our lives. We've been blessed to be in your presence this morning. As we leave from here, Lord, may the witness we have be the witness you'd have us be. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.